If you're shopping for your first vintage hand plane, this will probably happen to you. You'll find a tool dealer or a flea market vendor with a bunch of vintage planes at good prices. And you might pick out something like this. This is the Stanley Bailey number no. four smoothing plane. For those of us who are lucky enough to find good vintage tools, this is a precise, reliable tool. It's great for day-to-day -day work. So you find one of these in good shape for 30 bucks, and that's a good price. So you get your money and you go to pay the vendor. But right when you walk up to him, he says to you, oh, that's a great plane you've picked out there. But you know, I've got a couple of bedrocks. And you do not know what the hell he is talking about. But bedrock sounds good, and you don't want to look stupid. So you say to him, oh, yes, bedrocks. I'll take a look at one of those. And he hands you this. And you think to yourself, oh my, it's certainly a plane. It's got flat sides. I don't know, it looks a lot like the other one. But the way the vendor made it sound, bedrock, like it was just the best thing ever. You think, well, I do want to buy a good tool, so maybe I'll just get this one instead. So you say to the vendor, yeah, I guess I'll get this one. How much? And he looks you dead in the eye and he says, that plane is $180. And as soon as you finish having a complete heart attack at the price, you might look at that plane and think, $180 for what? If you're just getting into vintage tools, you might hear the word bedrock get thrown around a lot, and you might not even understand what it means. So here are the basics. Your regular, run-of-the-mill Stanley plane is called a Bailey pattern plane because it was invented by Leonard Bailey, who sold his incredibly effective design to Stanley in 1869. Stanley used these designs to dominate the hand plane market, and even their competitors eventually started making planes that were basically copies of the Bailey design. Today, when someone says hand plane, they usually mean a Bailey pattern metallic plane. But around 1902, Stanley wanted to offer a more premium line of planes that would be more expensive and aimed at craftsmen with more money. So they introduced the Bedrock line. These didn't replace the Bailey line, they were the next step up. On the outside, these two designs look very similar. The Bedrock just has these flat sides. We have to go inside the plane to really see the difference. Once you take off the lever cap and the blade, you see some differences in construction. This big flat surface is called the frog, and it holds the blade. On the original Bailey, this frog is just screwed into the plane body with two screws. You can see some small flat spots milled into the body, and there are matching surfaces milled into the bottom of the frog. The frog and the body have a sturdy connection, but the actual points of contact are pretty small. The bedrock plane doesn't have screws. It has these two pins, and you unscrew the frog from behind. Those back screws have points at the end. When I look at the pins that hold the frog, they have little holes in them which fit those points. The pointed screw comes in and engages with the hole in the pin. As the screw is tightened, that pin is pulled down and the frog is seated really tightly against the bed of the plane. Where the frog actually mounts to the bed of the plane, that's where we see the real differences in bedrock construction. On the bedrock, the base of the frog is a huge flat surface. The bed of the plane has another flat surface and little rails on the sides that hold the frog perfectly straight. The frog fits exactly to the plane body, and it can't twist side to side at all. The connection is rock solid. Stanley made this change to get a better fit between the parts of their planes, but also to give their flagship bedrock planes an easily adjustable mouth. The plane's mouth isn't just the opening in the bottom of the plane. It's the distance between the edge of the blade and the front of that opening. The mouth controls how thick a shaving you can take, and when the mouth is very tight, it presses down on the wood in front of the blade and prevents tear out. If you're working on very difficult wood and getting a rough surface, setting your plane with a fine mouth and a light cut can solve that problem. I've got both the planes here and the bedrock is on top. You can see that they both come from the factory with a pretty fine mouth, but both of them also allow that mouth to be tightened up. For the standard Bailey plane, adjusting the mouth is a bit of a process. You take off the lever cap and the blade assembly to expose the frog screws. Then you loosen those screws a bit and use the frog adjustment screw at the back to slide the frog forward a bit. Then you reassemble the plane, which takes a little fiddling around. This can take a little trial and error. I moved my frog too far forward and the iron won't come out of the mouth. After I took the plane apart and adjusted it a second time, I got a very tight mouth. This plane will only do the most delicate work. 
but it will also plane most difficult woods without tearing out. You get an adjustable mouth with the Bailey line, but it's inefficient and it breaks up the flow of work. Stanley wanted something better for their flagship Bedrock line. That's why they have that super complicated pin and screw set up to secure the frog to the bed of the plane. With the Bedrock, the mouth is adjustable and it is super fast. My Bedrock plane starts out with a pretty fine mouth, but tightening it up is a breeze. I don't even have to take out the blade. I just stick a screwdriver behind the frog, loosen the mounting screws a bit, give the frog adjustment screw a half turn, and retighten the mounting screws again. I get the setting right on the first try, and it's fast. That super tight mouth will handle some twisty grain and still give us a good surface. The improvements on the bedrock plane take a second to understand, and they seem very impressive. But it's important not to get caught in the appearance of the thing. You can look at a bedrock plane and think, oh look, there's this big bearing surface, there's extra iron, extra steel, a slicker mechanism, it must be better. But that can be kind of a trap. These things all look better, but none of them matter unless the plane actually performs better than a Bailey plane. The truth is in the work. So let's go do some. We'll start easy, by edge planing this white pine. The bedrock plane is solid on the wood. It glides into the cut smoothly, and the shaving is feathery. You really can't ask for more. So let's switch to the Bailey, with its sloppier construction and inferior frog design. And it's... honestly, it's kind of exactly the same. Same shaving, same surface, same effort. I can switch back and forth between the two planes all day, and I hardly notice the difference. But edge planing white pine? Come on, that's kid stuff. Let's get serious. Let's tap up a planing stop and go to work on a twisted piece of pine with knots and reversing grain in the face. I'm doing localized planing here, taking down the high spots to flatten the twist, but I'm still getting really wide and thin shavings. This bedrock is doing excellent work, but can the bailey measure up? Well, yeah. Smooth performance, wide shavings, and a glistening surface. The bailey isn't showing any weaknesses here. Let's make it a bit tougher. I picked this cherry offcut because it has a knot and reversing grain on both sides, and a rough edge. This should be a real test. I set the bedrock for a heavy cut to take off those saw marks, and it slices right through the wood. No trouble. But a switch to the bailey plane reveals no difference. So let's go to the faces and that twisty grain. That knot in the edge is throwing all kinds of reversing grain into the faces, and there's plenty of tear out from the planer at the mill. This is a real world problem board. If I can plane it, I can use it in a piece. If not, it goes into the burn pile. The bailey gets first crack at the job. I've left the mouth open and dialed in a fine cut. As I work, you can see those milling marks giving way to a smooth surface with neatly sliced fibers. My bailey has left me with a clean surface. Even around that knot, tear out is almost eliminated. I could put this stock right into a piece of furniture. The flip side has just as much nasty grain and some sapwood too. We'll give the bedrock a crack at this. And you know, it's kind of the same. The plane glides nicely and the shavings fly out. The surface is just as good and there's no tear out to get worried over. This test is a tie. But these are still sort of laboratory tests. We need to bring these planes into a more real world environment. And that's no problem. I've been finishing up this kitchen cupboard and now I'm ready to attach the trim get everything trimmed and straightened, and get it prepped for final finishing. This is the perfect test for these two planes. I'll use them all day long. First thing is to trim this face frame. My handy Ryoba saw handles the flush cut, but the final trimming is all hand plane. The pieces meet at right angles, and the cut is demanding because it transitions from squishy end grain to long side grain. I skew my Bailey plane for a slicing cut, and it handles both surfaces just fine. I switch to my bedrock, and the results are the same. Both surfaces are quickly trimmed, no crushed fibers on the end grain, and that frame is level with the case. Next, my top board is a bit bowed, and that's going to make adding trim really tough. I want to set both my planes for a coarse cut and take off material fast. Both these smoothing planes are pretty fine tools, but they'll take a heavier cut too. When the work is too fine to reach for a scrub plane, a heavy set smoother might be just the thing. Now, without even sharpening, let's go for the exact opposite task. I need these cabinet doors prepped for finishing, and I don't want to do any sanding. Let's make this a pure, hand plane finish, and try for absolute perfection on the surface. I set the bedrock for a heavier cut to take care of some unevenness around the glue joint, and then I can back the iron way off for a light finishing cut. 
This planing goes very fast, and after I've gone back and forth twice, I'm done. You can't argue with a finish-ready surface like this. But can the Bailey compete? Hell yes it can. Honestly, if you blindfolded me, I wouldn't even know which plane I was using. The bedrock is supposed to be so much more solid and precise, but look at the shavings the Bailey is making. Look at the width and the consistency. Check out the final finish. I swear, put these two doors side by side and you would never know they were prepped with different planes. They both look great. Just to be complete, let's finish off with a bit of end grain shooting in oak. Neither of these planes is my first choice for a shooter, but they both work. Both planes are a little light for this duty, but the Bailey leaves a square and clean surface. The bedrock might be a little better here, but the difference is subtle. It cuts end grain just fine, and the surface is just what I want. So look, I don't get it. I have heard for years about the bedrock line, their surgical precision, their rock-solid construction, their incredible performance, but I'm not seeing it. I used both of these planes for over a week, day in, day out. I did real-world, actual furniture building with them, and there was almost no difference. The bedrocks are even famous for supposedly being much heavier than the Baileys, but if I put one in each hand, I can barely feel a difference. The planes seem nearly identical. Now for sure, the bedrock wins on its easy adjusting mouth. It's a clever and effective mechanism, and you can change it fast without messing up your workflow. But here's the thing about that. I never change the mouth on my smoothing planes. Really, never. All good Stanley planes come with a pretty fine mouth to begin with. All these shots are me planing with the mouth open, like it comes from the factory, and I get very little tear out when I'm working. If I do get a little tear out, I usually just use a scraper. You might work with trickier woods than I do, but I'd rather have a plane with a medium tight mouth and just leave it alone. Now, I'm not saying the bedrock planes aren't any better, but the cult following they have among woodworkers and tool collectors does seem a little weird to me, especially if you know a little bit of history. Stanley introduced the bedrock line around 1903, but these planes were out of production by World War II. Meanwhile, the Bailey line soldiered on all the way up through the 60s and 70s. Now, there are a couple different explanations for why the Bedrock series went out. A lot of people said, well, by that point in the century, coming up to the war, we had a lot more machine production, less handwork, and there was just less demand for ultra-high quality premium tools like this. That's one explanation. Another explanation could be that craftsmen just actually weren't really impressed by the Bedrock line. Especially people who had already been using Bailey-style planes for decades these planes were still going strong and didn't really have any shortcomings. If you were a craftsman like that and you picked up one of these at a higher price, it might have been very difficult to justify. You might have been unimpressed and just not ever picked one up. This brings us to the question of why these planes are so valuable today. I don't think it's because they're so much better than the Bailey planes. I think it's because they're so rare. When you've got a bunch of collectors all coming in to buy up vintage tools, well, the things that are the most rare are automatically going to become the most valuable. Bedrock planes were produced for a short period of time and discontinued way before the Bailey line was, so there's a lot fewer of them around. And that's going to drive up prices a lot. But after having used this plane and compared it to a good quality Bailey, I just don't think the increase in price is justified. This plane's better. That adjustable mouth, the super solid construction, I can feel a difference. I would call this plane 10% better than a Bailey. And if you had the two planes side by side, I would gladly pay 20 or 30% more for this plane. But when I bought my Bailey, I got it at a flea market for 25 bucks, in good shape. I had to go to a tool dealer to get this bedrock, and with shipping, this thing cost me $155. Do I think this plane is justified in commanding six times more money than my Bailey? Hell no! Ladies and gentlemen, let us leave these things to the collectors and the cork sniffers. We've got woodwork to do, and we can do it just fine with a plain old Bailey-style plane. And listen, if you enjoy history and tool collecting and stuff like that, I super strongly recommend Garrett Hack's book, 
The Hand Plane book. It is by far the best book I have ever read about tools, and I have a lot of books about tools. Hack is a professional cabinet maker. He's extremely knowledgeable. He goes over hundreds of different models, and the photography in this book is unbelievable. This is truly tool porn. And unlike a lot of woodworking books, this one is available in paperback, so it's actually not that expensive. I will link to it down in the description. Just like always, this video is brought to you by my patrons on Patreon. My patrons make it possible for me to do a deep dive into a subject like the differences between different kinds of tools, do a thorough review, and bring you the straight dope for absolutely free. It's not free for me to make these videos, and it's not free for them. They give me a little bit of money every month, and that helps me bring this content to you. And in exchange, I give them all sorts of perks and extras. If you'd like to find out about that stuff, go on over to patreon.com slash rexkruger and check out the early access, the discussion board, articles, tool reviews, and other stuff I do only for the people who keep this content alive. I've really enjoyed making this video, and if you want to see more of them, let me know down in the comments and I can go into more detail about fun, interesting vintage tools. No matter what I do, I really appreciate you watching this video. See you next week.